Hello and welcome to One on One. I'm Vernon Ramos and I'm very pleased to say my guest today is the re-elected uh, elected president of the TTO seat, Fernando Tobago Olympic Committee, Brian Lewis. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We were having such a nice conversation before we started just now that I uh, almost lost track of, of the time right there. Yeah, first of all, congratulations Thank on, you on very the much. position. It's very important for this country given the historic importance of Olympic wins to us and how much it does for national development and national pride, isn't it? Yes, in terms of the Olympics. Yeah. yeah when, you, when you consider what happened and last year in August, yeah, I know, uh, London nobody 2012, really expected. Yeah. nobody expected, but I, I heard, I mean, I was in London, fortunately, there, the witness No coincidence, live. I'm sure, yes. Huh? No coincidence, I'm sure. No, no. Yeah. And I heard that it was, it was a fantastic um, situation in Trinidad, and I don't know if you recall, that weekend or that day, it had this terrible floods. In the yes, I was doing news that weekend. It was such a yeah. It was the eleventh of August. Saturday, it yeah. was Saturday, the eleventh of August. Uh, it was a tremendous day. I heard, you know, a lot of people. I met people who told me they cry and you know tears and stuff watching it. Um, it was tremendous. So, you know, sports has always proven over the years. Um, if you go back, well. 1976 with Hazley Crawford. Which I also remember very well, that yeah, galvanized then, the Then nation. he would have had, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure many people re would remember Atto Boldon in 1997 mm -hmm. when he won the World Championship in the 200 meters. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, who will forget? Bahrain and, and then Trinidad and Tobago in, in the World Cup 20, 2006. That game with Sweden. I don't know if you recall it. When I, the expectations, I just remember red everywhere. That's when, what yeah, when the expectations would have been that we might have lost, so it was, it was such a lift to the nation to think that, hey, we draw with Sweden, you know, you remember that? Just, sport has always put more over the years, Brian Lara's 400. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, in fact, very few things, I mean, even for people like me, I'm not really a sports person, but you get drawn into it. There's a kind of a national swelling of pride that you don't see normally, because normally we're so busy being divided mm -hmm. that very few things unite us, like a sporting event. Yep, sports, and that's why I just said, you know, Sports is a universal language mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you don't need to, you know, you see sports and you will, you will stand up next to somebody and it, whether they speak Spanish or French, you know, you're into football, you know, it's a universal language. And sport has this ability to unite people and societies and communities and that's why for those of us who are involved in sports, it's such a powerful tool for societal transformation. And, um, you know, it's something that I think gets undervalued a bit, I think, coming out of a col our colonial background, mm -hmm. where sport was really leisure and, and something you do People when, for certain when, class when you had would free be able time to, yeah. and something you had to be able to afford to do. Mm -hmm. But I think in, in, in recent years, the, the reality is that sport has become such an important thing culturally. You know, it's become a powerful, powerful cultural phenomenon. What's interesting as well, I mean, it can become a, a real nation unifier, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but in other countries as well. And yet, it also transcends borders so much that you'll find some Trinidadians get so passionate about, I don't know, Manchester or Barca or something like that, that they'll, they'll yeah, almost Madrid, want to pick fights with Real one another. Madrid or yeah, Madrid Yeah, exactly. It, it, I mean, it's, 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 you know, I've always told people, sports is, is, is not really a pragmatic thing, you know, it's very emotional. It, mm. it, 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 it's an emotionally intense thing, it's experiential. You know, it's something we feel rather than, you know, it's a feeling, it's a well, joy. Well, I guess by nature we are tribal beings. We always want to belong to a tribe. And I suppose sports, Identity. Yeah, identity. And sports really tags into that. That's Correct. A Very sense of identity so. and national identity, perhaps That's most right. of all. That's right. Especially when times are bad. Now, we've had a lot of talk recently, and I'm not going to get into it with you, uh, about 
the world uh, football governing body and money and things like that. You in your position now, this is a voluntary position, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, why are you doing it? I mean, it must be an awful lot of work for somebody who's running businesses himself. Yeah, be, it, it's really about me giving back, to be, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I, you know, if, I, if I may briefly, my history is growing up. Um, I've been involved in sports since the age of seven years, running about the streets and lanes of Bedford, uh, Belmont. Mm -hmm. um, the Savannah and Belmont Park was my playground and the lanes. But more importantly, I grew up like a number of other young people, um, single parent home, my mother, you know, and I was the eldest of four children. And, uh, you know, I surely struggled with the fact that we didn't, we didn't father was not wrong. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of issues. And um, sport made the difference for me. You know, it was, it was like sport became my surrogate father. And uh, the various people in sport at that time, mainly male, male offered positive and constructive role models. And uh, it was through sport that I, I learned self-discipline, uh, self-esteem, and uh, I owe sport a depth of gratitude. So the reality is that coming up through the sporting ranks, I mean, I played competitive sports, um, come, came up to the grassroots level in uh, primary school, secondary school sports, always passionate about sports, as I said. And, um, you know, I made a commitment because of, of, of what I had benefited from sport um, to pass that on. So, you know, I, I understand firsthand the powerful role that, that sport can play in the lives of young people and myself is, a, is, a, is an example of that. And uh, you, you put yourself in for a whole lot of tears and challenge, haven't you? Because, I mean, there's a lot involved in getting any nation and, and individual teams to an Olympic event, isn't there? Very much so. Um, Logistically alone, and, and not, not even talking about money. Yeah. No, no, well, you know, but fortunately, it's, it's not about me alone. It's a team of executives that includes some, some, some very good people, very strong leaders, very, very talented and bright people. Um, you have people like David Ingerfield and mm -hmm. Dr. Terry Alley, um, Annette Knott who I take particular pride in saying is she created history. She's the first ever woman to be elected as the Secretary General of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. And I think I played a critical part in that taking place. And I think it is an important milestone in terms of women and the involvement of women in sport in Trinidad and Tobago and this perception of a glass ceiling mm -hmm. that, that women could not get through. And I think that in that regard, uh, Mrs. Nutt has done a, and it's an important landmark in sport and the Olympic movement here in Trinidad and Tobago that a woman is now the Secretary General. The Assistant Secretary General is Diane Henderson, who is also well known and established in sport in Trinidad and Tobago. She's the chairperson of the TNT Marathon. You also have Dr. Ian Hippolyte, um, Gavin Warwick and Wendell Constantine. Mm -hmm. and uh, Kirsten Coombs as the one of the trustees, Larry Woman is the immediate past. Of course, yes. And then you have um, Senator Elton Prescott, senior counsel, who have served on the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee board for an extremely long time. Um, he has decided to retire, so to speak, from active leadership in the Olympic movement. So he's now the honorary attorney at law, obviously. And we also had Douglas Camacho, who has served for a number of years. And Douglas has decided to take a step back also. I mean, in terms of within the last 20 something years, I mean, Douglas Camacho and um, Senator Elton Prescott have made a tremendous contribution to um, sport and the Olympic movement here in Trinidad and Tobago. So, you know, there's a good team. There's a, there's a, then there's also people like Alexander B. Chapman. I mean, when you look at the history of the old Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee going back to when it was formed in 1946. Um, the first president was Sir Lennox O'Reilly. Then you had uh, John M. Ray. You then had people like um, Sir Courtney Hannes and Dr. Horace Gillette. You see the kind of names yeah. you had, Nolly Henderson. So you're standing on the shoulders of giants then. And, and you're uh, really following a great tradition. Yeah, and uh, Commodore Mervyn Williams and then Alexander B. Chapman into Douglas Camacho and Larry Romani. So the succession planning, the passing of the battle has always been a tremendous tradition and, uh, in the Olympic movement 
in Trinidad and Tobago. So, in fact, I'm the 10th president of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. That's a, it's a tremendous honor and a privilege. I never saw it as an, as an entitlement. And I'm tremendously grateful to the national sport organizations who voted for me, mainly. But there's also a lot of challenges ahead of you as well. I mean, it, it is no small feat to get a team to the Olympics, is it? No, well... I mean, the, the lead-up alone is, is horrendous. I mean, you've got so many yeah, different it's, things to coordinate. It's a big challenge. Yeah. But fortunately, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collective team effort. You have the national sport organizations, um, you know, pulling. Um, you have the Ministry of Sport and uh, Sport Company. And you have the sponsors. So it's a total team effort. I mean, yes... There are challenges, there will always be challenges, especially in uh, the economic environment we now live in. Is, is that the biggest challenge, money? I mean, the, well, I think that the reality is that I, I don't, yes, financial resources yeah. to sustain and the identification of, of, um, of sustainable revenue streams. But I think it is important for sport in Trinidad and Tobago to be transformed. You know, this, this, this concept and this image where we go cap in hand begging people mm -hmm. for a handout. Um, I believe that we need to adopt a strategic marketing approach where we, we talk about creating value. How do we create value for the sponsors? How do we create value for the public, the media? How do we change the way the society interacts with the national sport organization and sport? Um, you know, Sport, as we were saying earlier on, is a powerful tool for societal transformation, especially with young people. Mm -hmm. How do we capture that and uh, take it and, and create value for the society to appreciate where they're perfectly happy to, to, to fund sport and how does, how does sport, by creating this value, create the, the economic activity that, that creates the balance and the marriage between community which is sport, community, and economy. I guess it's also a matter of uh, getting a culture of investing in sport instead of just trying to capitalize on successful athletes. Correct. Which seems to be the case. Yeah. Very much so. But, you know, just it may be, it may be um, instead of saying investing in sport, you know, because people can't conceptualize, okay, what is sport? Mm -hmm. I, I tell people it's about investing in people. Which is true, it's we tend to forget that. It's about that point, investing yeah. in the human resources and the human resource of Trinidad and Tobago. It's just that, you know, it's not everybody is academically inclined. Um, it's not everybody. So that you have people who are being given a talent in sport, their sense of purpose and destiny is involved in sport. And what, happening, what happens is that the way the society is constructed, the way the education system is constructed, you find that. that you know, people tend to, they, they still have the concept of the dumb jock, mm -hmm. you know, that sportsmen and sports people and sportswomen, you know, we're not the brightest. And uh, what people it's, do, it's in a sense, is underestimate and undervalue the, 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 the role that sport can play, both as, as I said, a societal transformation and from in terms of developing an, an, an industry that contributes to the, the economic diversification of the of the of Trinidad and Tobago economy. Well, what's interesting, and you, you mentioned the idea of the dumb jock, and TNT, we've been very lucky in that we have some extremely articulate Olympians, don't we? I mean, we've done really well. And not just in the Olympics, even, even uh, Brian Lauer, of course, speaks very well. Correct. Atto Bolden, of course, is on American television, has been in the Senate here. Even Dwight York was Dwight now, York, of course, as well. Was yes. now moved from where people, where, where he was. I mean, it's tremendous to... I mean, commentating on Sky, Sky in, in, in England. So, yes, that, that's my point. My point is there is a stereotype. It's so to get rid of that stereotype and just invest of course, we in need the dreams to. of young people. That's right, we need to, because yeah. what I'm saying is that it's not everybody um, was cut out to be a doctor or a lawyer or a accountant or an actuary. Um, some of us, and I say us, because if I look at myself, uh, I could have easily been put in a box and say, well, from an academic perspective, I may not have met the academic yardstick. I mean, when you consider, I, I came out of Fatima College with two passes, and then I went back and repeated and got four. But that was in those days, four passes could have got me a job in the bank. Mm -hmm. Now, I will struggle to get a job in KFC, maybe. But the point is, through the years, I have 
because I've, I've, I've you know, they say tapped into what I, what I love and what I'm passionate about, sport, I've been able to make something of myself in terms of, I mean, now I have an executive master's degree in sports management with a specialty in governance. Um, I'm a part-time lecturer at UWE in the in the master's degree program the master's degree program in sports management teaching entrepreneurship in sport i mean my point is not that it's about me who would have ever thought mm -hmm. if you if you would judge me when i was growing up in belmont a single parent single son eldest son of a single parent you know having the challenges um well, I guess sport gave you discipline as well, didn't it? That's and what this was saying earlier on. It not only gave me discipline, it gave me a Ambition sense of self-esteem. Well. Yeah. yeah, it made me feel good about myself. Eh? I mean, I wasn't... I mean, I, I, I was doing well in, in sports. And, um, you know, so I couldn't... It wasn't that I was a failure. I mean, I was doing well at something. So the way I looked at it, boy, I'm good at something. So I, I might not be good at that, but I'm good at this. And therefore, That's yeah. right. And I'm saying it's not only about me. I'm saying that there are a, a lot of other young people um, with similar type stories where they have benefited from sport. And my point about it is that the society, the media, the public, the government, um, the business community need to take a look at sport differently. And it's not only sport. I would say the same with culture, with art and music. As I said, not everybody is academic. Is academically inclined, or their talents reside in 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 in, in academics, and you shouldn't write off a huge portion of your society, especially young people, on the basis of, as I said, how the society and the education system is constructed. In, in terms of the Olympic Committee and focus, I, I know you have to cover every possible team that would want to go up to the Olympics once they're able to qualify. But track and field will always be a Caribbean specialty, won't it? Yeah, it's because we've excelled in, the, in that. And maybe because of our socioeconomic background, it's the cheapest thing to get into quite often. As well, well, you know, you, you, you're hitting the nail on the head. It's what you call a, a wash your foot and come sport, meaning mm. not, not, not to be not to be I like negative, that expression, though. Yeah. Right? But it's a sport that you can easily you don't have go. to invest in equipment. Race, that's right. Yeah. You, you have a savanna or open space. You can do track and field. It requires no, no big set of equipment. Like I mean, if you had to play cricket, you need equipment. Mm -hmm. If you had to, if you had to um, play tennis, you needed a racket. All you need in track and field is a free spirit and a pair of legs. And that's right. Not even know, that, as we've seen in Pistorius. That's right, because yeah. you know have the Paralympians. Right. You know, so in that sense, you know, sport plays an important role, and, and that's really what differentiates the Olympic movement in the Olympic game because the Olymp Olympism is a philosophy of life that, it, that basically says that sport can be used to educate young people, to create peace in the world, to, to, to better themselves, to transform the society. So it has a bigger message, you know. It's, it's, more, than, it's more than just an Olympic game. It's more than just the playing of a sport. It's, 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 it's a mindset. It's a way of life. The philosophy that says that through sport, we can make a, a positive difference. And that's the basic concept of Olympism as a philosophy. So there's actually a philosophy of Olympism. Olympism eh? I, I, I've learned something new in this program frequently, and that's my new learning for the week from you. Uh, what was interesting with the last Olympics, and when Kishan Walcott won, I think the almost universal reaction, including myself, and I work in news, was we have somebody competing in Javelin. There we go. Because we don't even realize sometimes that we're so busy focusing on, you know, the 100 meter or whatever. We, we don't realize that there are other teams yeah. that we have up running in various yeah. sports. You're very right that there are a lot of young people pass, participating in, in various disciplines and various sports. And when you consider Keyshawn Walcott, I mean, a young man from very humble beginnings mm -hmm. in uh, Toko, mm -hmm. you know, and how is a life-changing event the Olympic gold medalist. And again, what it shows you is the power of sport. But, well, I thought, yeah, I'm no sportsman, but I, last time I was in Toko, I was staying at a friend's house, and they, happened, they went and bought javelins after the event. <laughs> because they, they have a house in Toko, and I guess they figured you have to have a javelin now. So all of us were throwing javelin, and I thought, look at the power of sport. Because right. one person from Trinidad and Tobago goes up, wins an Olympic, and all of a sudden we realize, this is a sport I had not even thought about. Correct. Let me try it. And That's that is right. the power of sport, isn't it? And the Olympics in Very particular. Much so. The power of sport and the power of the Olympic Games and, as I was saying, the philosophy of Olympism to make a difference, to transform a society. And, and this is what 
You know, I think it's important as a society that we take a look at sport differently because it's not only about the Olympic Games, it's about physical activity and healthy lifestyles from the cradle to the grave. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter what part of the country, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, your religion, race, gender, whether you're disab disabled or able, it's about healthy lifestyles. Speaking of which, of course, um, even as we speak in the Senate, there's a little ongoing answering going on about doping in sport. And the the anti-doping bill. Anti-doping bill. I have to ask you about that. The Olympics, of course, has been famous over the decades, mm -hmm. at least the decades I've been alive. For occasion, you'll have like, some very famous athletes suddenly being found to have been involved in, in, in doping, if you will. I mean, Ben Johnson comes to mind. Any number of athletes, uh, former Soviet Union athletes, of course, were famous for being eventually caught. How significant a problem is it right now? And in, in terms of a challenge for a nation like Trinidad and Tobago, there must be a tendency to want to help in whatever way you can for athletes, trainers, to say, well, listen, you know, we don't have the resources of them, but we can. How do you get us away from that kind of thing? Other than so we're very, we, have been, we have been very, very fortunate here in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the fact that culturally, our athletes, and the Caribbean athletes, to be fair, they, they tend to shy away from from doping, cheating, because most of the time when you speak with them, they tell you that, you know, they have to live here. So they, they will tell you, walking on Frederick Street, mm -hmm. if you have brought disgrace and shame on the country, it's not going to be an easy thing. Right. In Jamaica, it's the same thing. So, But in other areas, we seem to have a very cavalier attitude. I mean, I know a few gyms I go to, and people are really quite happy to say I'm taking steroids. Really? In Trinidad? Yeah, in Trinidad, yeah, definitely. Well, because I think the world of, of, of sports at the elite level, you have These aren't competing people. These are just people who just want to... I'm, I'm yeah. amazed at that, really. Yeah. So, but that, what you've just shared there highlights the importance of the anti-doping legislation. Mm -hmm. And the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee has, a, has been a major advocate in terms of this anti-doping in sport bill. So that we have actually been represented on the working committee that helped sit, that, that sat to meet to make the recommendations to the Ministry of Sport so that we have a keen interest and I'm, and I'm hopeful that the Senate will pass it with the majority that it needs because it, it has some um, constitutional limitations, mm -hmm. it impacts upon the freedom of movement. So that it needs, I think, a, it's a, a special it's majority. A, a special yeah. majority. It got that at the lower house. I think I guess nobody's going to say doping is good. I mean, no, listen. It doesn't do sports I, any favors to have people. No, but doping. I don't support doping in any form. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I have zero tolerance towards cheating and doping. But it's not only anti doping. Eh? I think that we need to also have an anti corruption, um, zero tolerance within sports in the terms of sport integrity. Because when we continue to have these scandals as it relates to financial or allegations of finance, financial impropriety, it, it, it hampers the overall image of sport. And, so, and it hurts, in fact, things like sponsorship as well, because very much so no because sponsor wants to be involved if there's I a I have this team. pet term that I use all the time, and it is that money is a coward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in other words, money doesn't go where it doesn't feel safe. Once there's any risk whatsoever, you just ah, stay away from it. Money heads the other way. And I guess you, you deal with risk on a daily basis in terms of your other business, so I guess you're yeah, looking so at things like that. Full-time insurance. In terms of, we have a few minutes left. In terms of vision for the organization, I know sometimes there are different kinds of approaches, and depending on what kind of organization you're into, you, you join, you'll either want to change things or leave them the same, or sometimes there's a grand vision even. Do you have a grand vision for changing, or do you feel the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee is where it should be right now? I think that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee is where it should be right now, but when you look at the future, we have to invent the future. Mm -hmm. We have to create the reality that we want. So in that, in that context, if you're not changing, the only constant, and it's not a cliche, is change. Because mm -hmm. if you're not changing, you're stagnating. And if you're, not, if you're stagnating, you're really going backwards. So that the Olympic Committee has to continue to grow, it has to continue to develop. But more than that, because the Olympic Committee is the umbrella body for Olympic sports, it, 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 it sits very high up in terms of people's mind and, and therefore I think that the Olympic Committee has to be a thought leader and an advocate for 
where sport will be in the, in the next decade. And I think that in that regard, the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee needs to be more of an advocate in changing the dialogue, as I was telling you mm -hmm. earlier on, in terms of the transformation of the sports sector in Trinidad and Tobago. I think that the, the sports sector, over the years and over the history, sport in Trinidad and Tobago has reflected the zeitgeist or the, so, or the times of, 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 of the spirit of the, the times. The spirit yeah. of the time. We know sport needs to reflect that because we are in the modern generation. The 25th century is ever changing. It's the social media. Mm -hmm. It's technology driven. It's innovation. It's creativity. And those are words that, that, that concepts, notions that, that people don't normally associate with sport. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that we need to that's where sport has to be now because it is so involved with youth and young people and human development that we have to keep pace. The demands and the expectations of the modern society has changed. So you have T20. You know, people's attention span is, is shorter. Changed. So, you adjust, so it means yeah. that the product and the services that sport has to deliver and the expectation and needs that sport has to meet, it has to change. And in that regard, I think that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee can play a huge role in advocating the transformation of sport in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, Brian, I'm not even a sports person, and you got me excited, so that's, that's telling you something. <laughs> so, Brian, President of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee, a pleasure having you in the program. I'm sure this won't be the last time I see you on the program here. I hope not. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. It's, it, it'll be anytime. As I said, it's been a pleasure. Thank you again. Thank you You've been much. watching One on One. Join us again tomorrow for another edition.